Welcome fellow Bereans to the Bereans Bible Institute. I'm Tim Warner, your teacher. We are in module number 11, going verse by verse through the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 11. This is lesson number 26. Last time we talked about the two witnesses in um, the first half of chapter 11. Um, we determined based on several details that the two witnesses are Elijah the prophet and also the apostle John. Both of these men had unfinished business that God um, let them know that they had unfinished business and uh, they are to come back in the end times in order to fulfill the mission that God has for them in the end times. Um, now we're going to get into uh, the uh, seventh trumpet beginning in verse 14. So let's go there. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is read uh, verses 14 through um, 19, the end of the chapter, and then uh, we'll talk about that. All right, we're reading from the Last Generation Version. Uh, it is available on our website, www.fourwindsfellowships.net. That's the number four. Don't spell it out. Uh, the rest is all lowercase. All right, um, verse 14. The second woe has come. Look, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh messenger sounded, and there were great voices in the sky, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our master and of his Christ, and he shall reign unto the ages of the ages. And the twenty-four elders, who are sitting before God on their thrones, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, Master God, the sovereign over all, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, because you have taken hold of of your great authority and begun to rule. And the nations were angry, and your wrath has arrived. Also the time for the dead to be judged and to give reward to your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those fearing your name, small and great, and to destroy those destroying the land. And the temple of God was opened in the sky, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings and voices, thunderings, a shaking, and a great hail. Now, you may notice in verse 14, it says the second woe has come. But where was the second woe described? Well, it was described all the way back in chapter 9. All right, the second, the, um, you may recall all the way back in the end of chapter 8, it's after the first four trumpets, the angel says, woe, 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 three times uh, concerning the last three trumpets that are yet to sound. Now, the reason the first four trumpets are separated from the last three is because the last three are what is called woes. What is a woe? Well, woe is, the, is a term that refers to great calamity. And the, these three woes, the last three of the seven trumpets, are called woes because the severity is much more intense with regard to God's judgment. And, of course, it corresponds to the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus talked about the, uh, the first part of it. He talked about as being the beginning of birth pains, comparing it to a woman giving birth. The beginning of birth pains, you know, they might be painful, but they're not really that bad. But then he, he talked about what occurs after the midpoint, which is the abomination, abomination of desolation. And he said that that would be great travail, all right? That is the intense birth pains. Now, why, why birth pains? Why did Jesus refer to this last seven-year period as a time of birth pains? Because he's referencing Isaiah 66, which talks about the arrival of the kingdom and the arrival of Jerusalem in its restored and perfected state. Uh, state as the home of Christ and the saints. He refers to that as Jerusalem as a woman giving birth. It's giving birth to the kingdom age. And so that's why Jesus used that kind of terminology. Well, John here, or the book of Revelation, is also borrowing from that same kind of uh, terminology. And it it um, it distinguishes between the intensity of of the travail of the travail okay and the first like again like i said the first four trumpets are that beginning of birth pains the last three are woes because they are the intense 
um, a travail or tribulation uh, that's to occur during the last three and a half years. And again, these, as I said before, these are divided into two halves of a seven year period. And we saw back in, um, in the uh, description of the, um, the two witnesses, just back a few, um, back a few verses, that both of those time periods, the first three and a half years and the second three and a half years, are described in verse um, two. Actually, two and three. Let me just just uh, go back there for just a second. It says, um, and exclude the. Um, and to exclude the court outside the temple, you should not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. And then you'll say you'll see in brackets it says they will also trample the holy city forty two months. Okay, and that's talking about the latter half of the tribulation, which is the time after the abomination of desolation when Jerusalem is just trampled by the Antichrist and his hordes. But prior to that, there is people worshiping in the temple. Right? And remember, part of the abomination of desolation is the, um, the, uh, that the Antichrist causes the, the daily sacrifice to cease. So the temple has to be present for the daily sacrifices to be taking place. And that's what John saw, the two witnesses, um, there during the time when the, um, the, two, uh, the temple and those worshiping in it there so there's there's clearly the daily sacrifices going on otherwise he wouldn't mention the altar and those worshiping there um, so that's in the first half and then the second half is when the city is trampled under feet and that's for 42 months it says here and the prophets prophesy 2060 days that's another three and a half years so we've got this two three and a half year periods don't confuse those thinking that they're both speaking about the same period of time they're not okay all right now let's um when he says here in, um, go back to uh, verse 14, when he says uh, the second woe has come, what he's doing now is he's, um, all of chapter 10 and, and the first part of chapter 13, all the uh, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 11 through verse 13 is a parenthetical statement where John uh, is given additional information regarding this whole seven year period. It does what happens in beginning of chapter 10 to the end of verse 13 of 11, 13 is not happening after the second woe. All right. It's going back and talking about the whole period of time. The first half being the time when the prophets prophesy the second half being the time when the city is trampled underfoot for 42 months. All right. So now when we get down to verse 14, what he's saying is when he says the second woe has come, he's going all the way back to the end of chapter um, nine, where the second woe is actually described in the last part of chapter nine. So what he's doing is he's picking up where he left off at the end of chapter nine. That's the point of saying, the second woe has come. Look, the third woe is coming quickly. All right. Now, let's go. Let's continue uh, beginning in verse uh, 15. <clears throat> so he says, Then the seventh messenger sounded, and there were great voices in the sky saying, quote, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our master and of his Christ, and he shall reign unto the ages of the ages. Now that's the end of that quote. Now, what what is that quote a reference to? Well, again, you may remember if if um, if you think back when we went through chapters four and five, I made a a point of stressing the fact that that whole scene in heaven with the with uh, God sitting on His throne and the Lamb opening the seals and all of that stuff that was going on and the 24 elders and the four creatures praising God and all that and bowing down before him. All of that is an expansion of the scene that's found in Daniel chapter 7. I want you to go back there to Daniel 7 for, uh, with me for a moment, please. <clears throat> and really, the, almost the entire book of Revelation is an expansion of Daniel chapter 7. All right. 
But um, when you go back to Daniel chapter 7, let's, let's read verses 13 and 14. Um, actually, go back to... Um, Go back to verse 9. He says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. Now, the Ancient of Days being seated is what John, when John was given the vision of being caught up into heaven, it says he saw a throne and one seated on the throne. Well, that's the Ancient of Days. But notice he had just taken his seat. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. It's not that, you know, um, Daniel says, I watched the, and I saw the Ancient of Days seated on his throne. No, he saw the Ancient of Days taking his seat on his throne. Now, what does that mean? Well, because this is the judgment seat. This is God's, this is the courtroom. In fact, later in the chapter here, Daniel calls this the court being seated. So uh, God seating himself on his throne and what John saw in Revelation 4 of, of uh, when he was caught up in vision to heaven of God on his throne, he was seeing him just having taken his seat in order to pronounce judgment upon the nations and all that we see here in Daniel. So it says, um, back to verse 9, I watched till the thrones were put in place and the Ancient of De Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. And his hair, the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning flame. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered to him. That's described in Revelation chapter 5 verse 11, also in John's description of this. Ten thousand times ten thousands stood before him. Now, look what it says. The court was seated. And the books were opened. And that's exactly what we see in Revelation. We see the court seated, which is the 24 elders, the four creatures, and then and then myriads of angels in attendance. And the books are open. And what's opened? If you continue reading in Revelation 5 and then in 6, we have the seventh sealed scroll, which is opened by the Lamb. Right? All right. So then... Now that's at the beginning of the time of tribulation. That's at the beginning of that entire seven year period or what's referred to as the 70th week, which is actually described in Daniel nine as well. All right. So this, this seven year period is during that whole seven year period, the court in heaven is convened and God has taken his seat on his throne and these other 24 elders and four creatures have taken their seat as well before the throne of God. They are worshiping and praising God while God is pronouncing his judgments upon the earth. But when we get to the very end of the tribulation, see that scene is still occurring through the entire tribulation. We get to the end of that and we come to the seventh trumpet, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Then that part of it, the very end of it, and what the final outcome of the court um, um, is, is described in, in Daniel 7, beginning in verse 13. Now look what it says. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Now who's the Son of Man? See, that's Christ. There's no question about it. That's why Jesus uses that term to refer to himself all through the Gospels. He says... Um, one like the Son of Man coming with or upon the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and this is the scene unfolding in the sky. And they brought him near before him. Who's they? Well, it's the ones who were also in attendance. We got all these thrones and so forth. They brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, if we continue reading in Daniel 7, we see that, um, in fact, let's just, it talks about the kingdom is going to be given to the saints and all that stuff. But uh, go to verse 26. It says, But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion. His dominion is the, the beast that's described in the previous verses. 
right? And oh, oh, by the way, notice the um, um, it talks about the second half of the tribulation also in verse 25, where it says the saints shall be given to his hand. That's the little horn, the Antichrist, for a time, time, and half a time. Again, that's that period of the three woes that we see in um, in the trumpets there that we read about in Revelation. All right, verse uh, 26. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. All right. Now, this verses verses 13 through 14 and verses 26 and 27 of Daniel 7 are the backdrop for the seventh trumpet judgment that we see here in Revelation chapter 11. Okay? Revelation 11, the seventh trumpet is simply expanding on this passage. No question about it. In fact, there's more information in Daniel 7 than there is uh, here in Revelation, I think. All right. But anyhow, let's uh, let's continue reading now in Revelation and see how this is the fulfilling or the fulfillment, I should say, of Daniel 7 and the kingdom being taken away from the beast and given to the son of man. All right. All right. So back to um, Revelation. It says uh, we I think we were in verse 15. Then the seventh messenger sounded, and there were great voices in the sky, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our master and of his Christ, and he shall reign unto the ages of the ages. Right. Again, that's the fulfillment. Verse 16, And the twenty-four elders who are sitting before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying now again these are the thrones that were put in place in the sky that Dan that Daniel was observing during the time of tribulation all right and it's the 24 elders now what do they say and by the way i think i mentioned this before but it is my opinion and this is just my opinion it is my opinion that what is going on in the sky is going to be observed by people on earth you know, Daniel says he was watching in the night visions and he could see this stuff happening in the sky. All right, well, we also noticed, you may remember back in um, when we were going through the seven seals, that at the sixth seal, it says that um, that the, um, the kings of the earth hid themselves in the rocks and in the caves for fear of the Lord. And what did they cry out? Hide us from the face of him who is sitting on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of their wrath has arrived and who will be able to stand? Well, if they're hiding from his face while he's seated on his throne in the sky, they see him. They can see it. All right? And they're scared to death. All right. Anyway, it says uh, that these... these uh, for 24 elders fall down on their faces, worship God, saying, quote, We give you thanks, Master God, the sovereign over all, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Now, notice this phrase, the sovereign over all. It's extremely important that you understand that the word God in the Bible. You know, if you, if you ask the average Christian, what does the word God actually mean? What's the definition of the word God? They'll just stumble around. They have no idea what it means. They'll say, oh, I know who God is. Well, I'm not asking you who God is. I'm asking you, what does the word itself mean? What does it imply about the one whom we call God? Right? And they have no idea what the word means. So I'm going to tell you what the word means, and you need to write this down because it's one of the most important facts that you can know to properly understand what the Word of God has to say. If you, if, you, if, you, if you understand the Word God this way, it'll make perfect sense every time it's used in the Bible and it'll clear up a lot of confusion. All right. A lot of people think that the word God refers to his qualities, refers to a divine, the divine essence, if you will. All right. You'll see this in Trinitarian 
theology where you know they talk about one god in three persons well one god they're not talking about that they're not using the word god when they refer to one god in three persons they're not referring to the word god as a person because they're dividing the the word god or this you know whatever whatever it refers to as three persons so god the word god cannot refer to a person and it's singular so when when they do that when they define god as something other than the person of the father then they create all kinds of havoc and what they're doing is they're saying that god when they say that they're saying that god the word god it refers to the substance or essence of what god is that is there are three persons who share the same divine impersonal essence okay or substance or whatever you know the early creeds were all about trying to define this stuff all right and so they define god as an essence or a substance as opposed to a person but that's completely wrong the word god never ever in the entire bible refers to the substance or essence of what God is. It always It's always personal. It always refers to a person who is called God. All right? Always. And so what does it mean and what does it imply about this person that we call God? Well, it's stated right here. I got it, I've got it in bold type right there. It implies the sovereign over all. That's what the word God means. It means the sovereign over all. The one who has a dominion and exercises dominion and has the authority and the right to exercise dominion. That's what the word means. And so that's why that's why the word God can be used in a personal way. Just like, you know, Thomas, when um, he saw Jesus, you know, and he, you know, Jesus told him to put his finger in the uh, in his hands and so forth. He, he exclaimed, you know, my Lord and my God. My God implies you are the sovereign over me. Not just sovereign over all, you're a sovereign over me. As does the word Lord also does, right? But God is sort of the a step up in authority over the, the word Lord. All right, so God is the sovereign over all creation because he created it all. Now, this also explains the use of the word God for false gods, because it's in the pagan religions, there they had a various God who exercised dominion over a certain aspect of nature. Now, of course, they're false because they don't really have that power. But they looked upon them as though they had power, which is why you had, you know, an Egyptian God of the Nile who supposedly caused the flooding of the Nile in order to irrigate the uh, the crops and they had they had gods of fertility and gods of all other things and supposedly they exercised dominion over that um, small domain but they didn't exercise dominion over everything which is why you had gods that were competing against each other and all this other stuff that you have in uh, in paganism well the word God, again, means the sovereign over all. And notice what these 24 elders exclaim. We give you thanks. It's almost like there's this enormous relief coming from these 24 elders. We give you thanks, Master God, the sovereign over all. The one who is, who was, and who is to come. That's talking about the fact that he's the eternal one. Because you have taken hold of your great authority and begun to rule. Now, what does that imply? If, if now only at the very end of the tribulation, at the seventh trumpet, they are in so much joy because God has finally taken hold of his great authority and begun to to rule, what does that imply? It implies that God has not been acting as sovereign over all previously. Even though he has the authority, it's his authority and he can exercise it if he wants to. He hasn't been doing so. And we see that that's true. And why is that true? Well, it's because during the last 6,000 years, almost 6,000 years, somebody else has been exercising dominion. 
and God has allowed it to go on. All right, now let's look at who that uh, person is. Let's go to um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. <clears throat> When God created um, Adam and Eve, uh, God spoke, speaking to his son, who is his agent in creation. It says, verse 26, And God said, quote, to his son, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have, now here's the part, the dominion part. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, quote, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Notice that, subdue it. That is, take dominion over it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, God gave the dominion of the earth to Adam and to his descendants. But what did Adam do? Well, first, Satan deceived Eve, Adam fell into sin, and Adam lost the dominion of the earth. Now, go over to um, Psalm chapter 8 for just a moment. David recognized in this psalm, recognized that God had given dominion over the entire earth, including all animals, to Adam. That means animals should obey. You know, God brought the animals to Adam to even name them. And that showed that Adam had dominion over them. Do animals obey man today? No, not at all. Because man lost his dominion. Look what David says here in Psalm chapter 8. Beginning in verse 3. He says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? Now, see, God created the heavens and the earth, and he, you know, he created all the planets and the stars and the sun and the moon and all that stuff that is so great and and we marvel at it and we look up at the night sky so david when he looks at he looks at the sky and then he looks you know at how great it is and then he looks at mankind and he says what is a man that you are mindful of him you know we're like an ant compared to this stuff and the son of man that you visited him you have made him a little lower than the angels and you crowned him with glory and honor you may notice this you made him or you created him to have dominion over the works of your hands you put all things under his feet all sheep and oxygen even the oxen even the beasts of the field the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea O lord our god how excellent is your name in all the earth so david was really really marveling at how god had looked down upon man, his lowly creature, and put all the earth under his dominion. But man didn't keep that dominion, did he? Go over to um, Matthew. Uh, I, don't, I had the reference written down here in one second. Matthew chapter 4, verse 7. <clears throat> This is the um, Jesus' temptation um, by the devil. It says, And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Now, actually, I should have chosen the account, I believe it's in Luke, where it's this, um, what the devil said is a little bit um, fuller, and that is, the devil said, 
that if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms of the earth because they have been delivered to me. And he was actually correct in his statement. They had been delivered to him because of Adam's sin and his fall from um, grace. However, Satan's dominion has been limited, and it's been limited to 6,000 years. And we see that in, in the Revelation chapter 20, which we'll get to later, but Satan will be bound for a thousand years beginning at the coming of Christ and that is when the seventh trumpet sounds that's when Satan will be bound and the kingdom will be delivered to God's son right so in Hebrews chapter 2 beginning in verse um, 5 Paul writes for he has not put the world to come and that's the age that we're talking about the kingdom of which we speak in subjection to angels but one testified in a certain place, and again he's referring to David in Psalm chapter 8, quote, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. And of course, if, if Paul would have continued quoting Psalm 8, you know, he would have quoted the part about, you know, including all the fish and the birds and everything else, right? But then he says, look, look at this. Then he says, For in that he that is God put all in subjection under him that is man, he left nothing that is not put under him. That is, nothing with regard to the earth was left out. But notice Paul's conclusion. He says, But now we do not yet see all things put under him. And again, he means under mankind. The whole creation, the earth that is, not the sky, but the earth and all of its creatures were put under the dominion of Adam, Paul says, but yet right now we don't see that in reality. Even though God, that's how, why God created man, right? It says God uh, created him in order to have dominion. But Paul says, man does not have dominion. But then he says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Now, when Christ Jesus was made lower than the angels, that's talking about a transformation. That implies that he previously was higher than the angels, which is true. He was made a little lower than the angels, that is, on the level of mankind, for suffering of death. That is, why was he made lower than the angels? For the suffering of death. He had to be human in order to suffer death. But now we don't... Um, let, me, let me back up because I'm losing the flow of the sentence. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, now we see him crowned with glory and honor. That's because he's at the right hand of the Father, according to Psalm 110, right? That he, by the grace of God, may test death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, that is, the creation was all made for the Son. And by whom are all things, that it was made through the Son in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. All right, so the point he was making here is that the creation is going to be returned to the dominion of man when it is seized from Satan in the age to come. That's what the seventh trumpet is all about. It's all about the kingdom being taken away from Satan and his minions and given back to man, but not just any men, but to the man, the son of man in Daniel chapter 7, the one who was in the beginning with God, but then who became flesh when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, then the Son of God became the Son of Man. 
And then it's that son of man who then will seize the dominion away from Satan and will rule just as Daniel 7 says and as it says here. All right, so back to uh, Revelation. Um, it says, verse um, 17, we give you thanks, Master God, the sovereign over all, the one who is, who was, and to his, to his to come, because you have taken hold of your great authority and begun to rule. This is seizing back. And the nations were angry, and your wrath has arrived. All right, so we have two things uh, being described in verse 18. That is, the fate of the wicked and the fate of the righteous. The nations were angry and your wrath has arrived. What is that referring to? Well, that statement right there is coming right out of Psalm chapter 2. How does Psalm 2 begin? Well, let's take a look at it. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? Isn't that right? I'm, I'm not going to go there. You know, you know it. You can look it up. The kings of the earth. It talks about how they rise up. And... Uh, against the Lord and against his Christ or his anointed. And then it's, you know, goes on to say, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. And then Christ repeats what the father said to him. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, I'll give you the nations for your inheritance and so forth. All right, so that's what, that's what that is referring to there. The nations were angry. Your wrath has come. They're raging against God. In fact, when we get to chapter 19, you're going to see that, that, it's, it says specifically in chapter 19 that when the armies of the nations gather at the Battle of Armageddon, that they gather together to make war with the one seat, uh, seated on the throne and, with, and against the Lamb. So they're actually gathering together with this stuff going on in the sky of the courtroom seated and all that stuff. The nations down on earth under the beast are gathering together a, re a rebellion and they're going to try to overthrow the Son of Man when he comes from the sky to seize the kingdom away. They're actually, you know, with the beast and all, they're going to try to overthrow him at his coming. So they're fully aware of what they're doing. All right. That's pretty remarkable stuff, I think. All right, so he says, the nations were angry, your wrath has arrived. But then he says, also, the time for the dead to be judged and to give reward to your servants, the prophets and the saints and those fearing your name, small and great, and to destroy those destroying the land. So again, we've got the two groups. Now, flip over to Daniel chapter, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 12 for just a moment. <clears throat> Verse one, it says, at that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And Jesus references this passage when he talks about the time of great tribulation, um, you know, that there's never been anything like it before or after. And he says, and at that time your people shall be delivered. And this is, happens at the seventh trumpet. Everyone found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, to, some to sh excuse me, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And so then he goes on also later in the chapter to talk about Daniel will receive his inheritance at that time. All right, so rewarding the saints and the prophets and those who fear your name, they're going to be rewarded with the resurrection of the just and immortality and the inheritance in the kingdom that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and then continue to expand on that um, throughout the prophets. But the wrath that comes and the destruction of the wicked uh, described here is also what the Apostle Paul talked about in 1 Thessalonians. Let's go there for just a minute. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> Should have had a bookmark in there. All right, 1 Thessalonians 5. Look at verse 1. He says, uh, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you for yourselves know perfectly 
that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Again, he's using the, the labor pains metaphor. But notice that it is sudden destruction that overtakes them, and they will not escape. But he says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Now, this day is going to come upon two classes of people. It's going to come upon believers who are not sleeping, but they are watching. It's not going to surprise them when it arrives, because we have all of this and all of Revelation, everything to tell us how to recognize everything. And But it is going to come upon and surprise the wicked. Now, how's it going to surprise the wicked if they see... Um, you know, all the stuff that's going on in the sky, they see, you know, the court seated, all that stuff happening. And um, how is it going to surprise them? Well, it's going to surprise them because they think they can overthrow the Son of Man when he arrives. And it's going to take them by surprise that they are consumed by the wrath of God. All right, now go over to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look what he says here. Uh, verse 4, he says, So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled that is, the, you're, the, those who are being persecuted by the wicked, to give you rest with us. And notice this, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, that's when the Son of Man comes with the clouds of heaven, he's given the authority to reign, and then he arrives. Uh, he's coming with his mighty angels, that's the armies in heaven in Revelation 19, in blazing fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Literally, the Greek says with permanent annihilation. From the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he comes in that day, notice day is capitalized because it's the day of the Lord that we read about in, in 1 Thessalonians 5. When he comes in that day, two things are happening on the very same day. We Christians are being delivered from their persecutors on the very same day that he comes and destroys with permanent annihilation from his presence these wicked when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. What an awesome day. That's the day of the Lord. That's the day of the return of the Son of Man from heaven. On the clouds of heaven, as it said. All right, so uh, back to Revelation chapter 11, verse... Um, uh, verse um, 19. It says, And the temple of God was opened in the sky, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, voices, thunderings, a shaking, and a great hail. Now, why why is this here? Why It says that the temple of God was opened in the sky. You may remember that in the book of Hebrews, it's, uh, Paul stresses the point more than once that the temple, or the, I'm sorry, the tabernacle that God commanded Moses to build in Mount Sinai, that he was shown... Moses was actually shown the temple and he was to build it according to what he was shown. Now, what was Moses shown? Well, Moses was shown the same thing John was shown here, and that is the temple in heaven. And so Moses was then told, according to Paul in Hebrews, that he was to make the tabernacle according to the pattern that was shown to him on the holy mountain, that is on Mount Sinai when he was up there. All right. So, there's a temple of God in heaven, which is the original. And then there's the temple of God on earth, which is a copy of the temple in heaven. But here it says the temple of God was open in the sky and the Ark of the Covenant was seen in his temple. That is in the temple in the sky. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense at first glance because 
the temp the ark of the covenant in the in the temple that Moses made I'm sorry the tabernacle that Moses made was a representation of God's throne it was a it was sort of to take the place of God's throne the holy of holies in the tabernacle was to represent this temple in heaven and the the throne of God is there but in the tabernacle that Moses built he was to build this sort of a representation of God's throne with the it had had the two um, golden um, um, angels with their wings spread across the top of it and then there was the glory what was called the Shekinah glory that um, resided over the mercy seat that is the top plate underneath these angels wings was this glory that would glow there as long as God's presence was among his people now was did God leave heaven and come and sit on that golden thing there no he didn't but if you read Solomon's prayer um, when he dedicated the temple he prayed that God would have you know some aspect of his presence come and be among them and I encourage you to read actually uh, Josephus's account of that Josephus specifically when he's uh, reciting Solomon's prayer that God would come he said uh, he asked for some portion of your spirit to come and dwell in this temple that I have built and he says the heaven of heavens is not enough to contain you never mind this little this little temple that I have built but would he requested that some portion of God's spirit would dwell there as you know God sort of putting his pinky there all right um, in the temple as just a little manifestation of his presence being among the nation of Israel so it's strange that the temple of God is seen in heaven at the end of the tribulation now what does that signify it doesn't say I mean the Ark of the Covenant it doesn't say that the Ark of the Covenant is caught up into heaven at this point but it's in heaven and the Ark of the Covenant again remember the temple in heaven did not have an Ark of the Covenant it had God's throne so the Ark of the Covenant is what Moses actually made the box overlaid with gold with the with the golden cherubim and all that on it. so that box that Moses made was seen in the temple in heaven why is that the case two reasons number one first of all that has to be on earth when the during the first half of the tribulation when the worshipers are worshiping God in the temple and before the altar as we saw with the two witnesses at the beginning of chapter 11 all right you cannot go what 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 uh, revelation 11 in, indicates is that w normal worship at the temple is going to re resume during the testimony of the two witnesses that is that first 1260 days in order for that to resume and to continue you have to have all you have to have a priesthood which is why Elijah's presence is necessary to anoint the priest the prophet had to anoint the priests and secondly all of the festivals in order to resume the worship according to the law of Moses you have to keep all of the festivals and all of the festivals included the high priest once a year going into the Holy of Holies and sprinkling the blood on the Ark of the Covenant that's Yom Kippur the Day of Atonement all right you cannot have the resumption of the worship according to the law of Moses without that taking place so the Ark of the Covenant has to be in the temple that's described earlier in the chapter. Well, when we get to the end of the tribulation, after that last three and a half years, after the Antichrist, remember the Antichrist is the one who is going to, at his instigation, the two witnesses are going to be killed. And 
then he's going to he's going to stop the daily sacrifices. He's going to place the abomination of desolation. How's he going to place the abomination of desolation in the temple? Well, first of all, what is the abomination of desolation? Well, he's uh, that phrase comes right out of Daniel, and it's used in reference to what took place with uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, where an, the image of Zeus was placed in the Holy of Holies. Well, that's the only way the Antichrist is going to be able to go in and place that there while well, after God has been accepting this worship while the ark was there is for that ark to be taken away. And that ark is going to be taken away. God is going to take that ark away just before the abomination of desolation. When the two witnesses are killed, God is going to remove the ark from the temple in Jerusalem and he's going to take it up into heaven. And that's why that ark is seen in heaven here at the end of the tribulation. All right, it's up there. But the second reason why the ark is seen in heaven is because it's never again coming to earth. Uh, if you go to flip over to Jeremiah chapter 3, in the kingdom, is there going to be a temple? Yes, Ezekiel describes it in great detail. And he also, Ezekiel also describes the worship that's going to take place in the kingdom. There's going to be the Passover observed. There is going to be Pentecost observed. And there's going to be the Feast of Tabernacles observed, according to Ezekiel. However, there's one thing that is omitted. And that is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would shed the blood and bring it into the Holy of Holies. And that's because Christ's sacrifice is permanent and forever. All right, Jeremiah chapter 3, look at verse 16. Then it shall come to pass, when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they shall say no more, quote, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made anymore. That is another one to replace the one that's missing. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord. See, the Ark of the Covenant was a representation of the throne of the Lord. Now he says, Jerusalem will be called the throne of the Lord and all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. And no more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. So what he's saying essentially is, is that Yom Kippur will not be celebrated in the kingdom. Now this ought to tell you something. What it tells us is that the law of the kingdom is not the law of Moses. The law of Moses will be reinstated for a period of seven years for the last three and a half years. I'm sorry, the last uh, seven years. We learned that from Daniel chapter 9 when he's talking about the 70 week uh, prophecy. For seven years, God is going to strengthen the covenant. That is the covenant he made with Israel at Mount Sinai. And he's going to allow the Israeli nation an opportunity to repent according to the terms that are found in the law of Moses, specifically in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And that's what that purpose is for, to allow that time of repentance according to the law. After that period of time and after the period of Antichrist, there is not going to be a return to the law of Moses in the kingdom. There is going to be a return to the new law, which is the new covenant. The new covenant contains a law. And that is the law for the kingdom. We as Christians have been allowed a preview into the new covenant. We've been allowed to um, partake in part of the new covenant, but it's going to be in full force with its laws, with its governmental regulations, according to all that's prophesied in uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and other places regarding that new law in the kingdom. That will uh, that'll take place then. All right. So the law of Moses is not the covenant of the kingdom. It's only going to temporarily be put back in place during the time of tribulation and only for the nation of Israel because it was only given to the nation of Israel. Okay.
All right, well, um, that's it for uh, today, and um, we'll pick this up again um, next time, and um, hope you'll be back with us. God bless you all.